without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Jose Domingo Cruz. Mr. Cruz is an instructor at Kitakyushu University. He has been teaching in Japan since 1991, and he specializes in authentic listening, fluency, shadow talking, emergency remote teaching, and Zoom educational application. Today, Mr. Cruz will be giving us a presentation about teaching fluency via structure control and virtual classrooms. So without further ado, let's begin today's keynote presentation. Mr. Cruz, please. Uh, thank you, Deanna. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, to all of the uh, honored dignitaries that are here today, all of the JTEs and ALTs. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to just make one correction. Uh, it's probably just a small typo. Um, the uh, acronym uh, SCVC actually stands for Structure Control and Verbal Classrooms. Uh, virtual classrooms is only, has only been a thing in my mind uh, through 2020. I'm sure it's been a thing on your mind all the way through 2020 as well. Um, uh, I want to talk to you today about what I have been doing uh, through most of my university career and how I think it can help you as junior high schoolers and, and uh, junior high school teachers, and you're not junior high schoolers, as junior high school teachers and high school teachers to try to get to your students what I think especially a lot of the ALTs see uh, a need for, and that's to get them to start speaking, uh, to get them to start making use of these words and these phrases and these grammatical structures that they've been studying for a long time, but um, at least for the students that come to my university or universities, I teach at both uh, Kitakyushu University and Kyushu Kogyo Daigaku, uh, tell me that um, what they wanted to be able to do was just actually to speak English and not so much to get more knowledge. I mean, for, of course, some students will say, I, I really want to do well on my tests. And that, I'm told, is what will help me uh, become an English, a better English speaker. Um, I tell them, well, those two don't necessarily go hand in hand because I've never taken a TOEIC test and I'm a pretty good English speaker. Um, but I try to get them into a different frame of mind about how they're, their speaking studies uh, could, could, could be enhanced by actually doing more speaking and not so much note taking, not so much uh, pontificating on, on uh, this particular grammar structure. So let me start um, sharing my presentation slides. Uh, by the way, uh, through this, I'll be, uh, I hope, um, aided by a friend of mine, uh, Jenny Crittenden, uh, she'll be turning on her camera, helping me with a couple of demonstrations here as soon as we get to the point where I want to show you, not just tell you, but show you uh, what it is that I do in my classrooms. But first, a bit of a background on what it is that uh, I'm going to be talking about. So uh, let's uh, move forward here. Oops, sorry, just jumped ahead. Sorry. Okay, let me go back. All right. Fluency. What is fluency? Very often when I give this presentation, I ask uh, in, in, a, in a large auditorium or uh, to a proper physical audience, I ask the audience to break up into groups and to discuss amongst themselves, what is fluency? How would you define it? And um, what happened, and I can't do that right now. I've discovered, I tried that before and it didn't work. Uh, what I did find though, when I was doing this in a physical classroom, was that people would come up with all kinds of definitions of fluency, which was always very interesting to me because every time I did that small task in a presentation over about a decade, people would always come up with different things to say. Oh, fluency is the ability to speak well. Can't argue with that, that's factually correct. Uh, fluency is having good grammar, good pronunciation. Uh, fluency is this, fluency is that. Fluency is being able to uh, uh, listen without um, uh, or being able to speak without dictionary. And there never seemed to be a set definition of what it is. Now, for those of you who know the Sefer, okay, whoops, forgot. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I can't double click on this. For those of you who know the Sefer, let me just jump back again. The CEFR, the Common European Framework Reference. This is a well-known um, European-based 
way to define English levels, and it has its own Wikipedia entry. And this is fairly famous among um, university instructors and uh, language researchers around the world. Basically, everyone looks at this and says, this is how you define English levels or language levels because the Sefer has its references for Spanish, uh, references for French. But this one is sp speaking about English. And it goes from A1 to A2. Those are the two lowest levels. So the top one, A1, A2, the two lowest levels. Then B1, B2, and B2, you can see here at the top, C1 and C2, which are actually at the bottom, but denote the highest levels, which basically means native proficiency. A1 and A2 and B1 are not included in here because they don't even discuss fluency. The, uh, the idea of fluency, according to the uh, CEFR, begins to become an important concept only in the last three levels of, um, of how fluency is approached in language learning. And you can see here, I've marked it in yellow, that uh, in B2, the idea of B2 basically being uh, an upper intermediate, that would be, if you're talking about TOEIC, that would be maybe about 610, 600 and maybe 615 to 600, let's say. C1, um, uh, that would probably be, I don't know, about 700, maybe, uh, 750. C2, you're approaching the range of about 850, 990. If you were thinking about it as Aiken, um, although that's not really the, uh, the best way to sort of compare it, uh, C2 would be, of course, EQ or better, okay? Uh, C1, I would probably say that's more like about um, Jun EQ. And B2 would be more like Jun NiQ uh, because there, there were sort of these variations and ranges. But the point I want to make here is if you look at that little yellow mark, I don't know if you can see that for the people in the auditoriums, that yellow mark in each area, okay? See here, if you can see my cursor. In B2, you are at B2 if you have a degree of fluency. You're at C1 level if you can express ideas fluently and C2, you're very fluent. Now, when I think about learning a language, I think about the absolute goal as fluency. When I, when I think about, uh, let's say I wanted to become fluent in French again. I used to be fluent in French. To me, that doesn't mean that I want to be able to um, attend a concert or read uh, subtitles without using a dictionary. It means that I want to be fluent because I know what fluency is. And I want uh, to be able to speak Spanish fluently someday as well too. But the way that Sefer works, or the way that the goals that we've given students up to now with, well, get a TOEIC test score at this level, uh, get this level of uh, Aiken, that's what's going to make you uh, know that you're at a high level. I don't know if that's really what I want to give my students as a target. What I want to give my students as a target is is to get them to think about their speaking ability. But unfortunately, they don't get a lot of help when it comes to their speaking ability um, in, I have to say, in high school or junior high school, because so much of our work is test oriented. Uh, the idea that if you get uh, 90 on this exam, that means uh, you know the way we made this test, that means you should probably be able to get like a, a 500 on a TOEIC, or maybe you'll be able to get a, a, a third level on an ACAN or whatever it is that we're thinking because we're so used to actually writing paper tests. And if we're gonna be asking students to actually start thinking about their speaking, we have to help them understand their goals in a different way. So first of all, we have to get them to understand that speaking can be quantified. Your speaking skills aren't this mysterious thing that suddenly appear after you get to C1 or C2 or will mysteriously start coming out of your mouth if you get a TOEIC 750 or a TOEIC 800. Because I know some TOEIC 800 students and I know some TOEIC 750 students that cannot speak fluently, cannot. Not by the next definition that I'm going to show you. And that definition is this one. You already saw it a little bit. The minimal definition of becoming someone who's fluent, okay, first I'll give you the, the numerical number. It's 110 to 120 words per minute, okay? 120 words per minute basically comes down to two words per second. 
and two words per second kind of sounds like this if you were to speak that slowly. Sometimes there are pauses, but eventually this is the way that people will speak at about two words per second. Now you're thinking, oh, Jose, that sounds artificial. That's not the way that you speak. Well, that's because you've heard me speak before and you've gotten used to my voice. But 110 to 120 words per minute. Think about, let's say, a four-year-old or even you know, a fairly intelligent three-year-old who started speaking early. They will speak at about that rate, 120 words per minute. And you're not going to be able to convince me that that three-year-old is not fluent for their age category and their skill category. They are fluent. They just happen to be three years old. Now, of course, I'm more, I'm, I'm faster than they are, but there's a threshold that you reach. I'm more fluent than they are, but that doesn't mean that they're not fluent. Just like, you know, uh, well, uh, there's so many analogies that I could say, but like there are really bad baseball players. There are really good baseball players, but you're all baseball players and you're all professionals because you all have a salary. And in that same sense, fluency at its minimum, minimum level, I think, looking at the research that I have, um, can be defined as something about 110, 120 words per minute. You fall below that, you're starting to speak at about 100 words per minute, 90 words per minute. You're starting to probably having to deal with your, with your broken English with a lot of pauses or a lot of disfluencies because you don't have, pardon me, the right vocabulary or um, you're, you're forgetting grammatical structures. It's making you slow down. But if you can get over all of that and get to 120 words per minute, then you probably are fluent. Now, this is important because if we want kids to understand why we're teaching them certain things, we have to tell them, this is why we're teaching you this way. We want you to be able to achieve this goal. In the same way that um, you know, if you're a, a high school uh, gym coach, or let's say you're, you're part of the managing team for the high school track and field team, you tell students, well, Listen, uh, you're, you're a pretty fast runner, but I want you to start targeting 12 seconds for the 100 meter dash, because that means that you're gonna be able to get to the next level. Hey, that was pretty good, 11 and a half seconds. Can you get down to 11 seconds? That'll get you into you know, national class running. You, you're gonna be doing really well at the national levels for the 100 meter dash. Wow, you're, you're at 10 and a half seconds. You're a world-class runner. I'm, I'm, gonna ask, act, I'm going to actually ask you to be elevated to the Olympic team. We know that because we can measure these things. But we've never had a really good way to measure speaking. We, we know how to measure things like um, your vocabulary. That's easy. Write these words down on a list in a certain amount of time. But in terms of speaking, fluency, it's always been very vague, right? Like, well, if you can speak well, well, if you can speak beautifully, well, if you can listen without having to use a dictionary, that's too vague, I'm afraid. Uh, but this, I think, is very direct. You can tell when someone's getting faster because you can tell them that you're speaking at about 130, 180 words per minute. You also put parameters on it that you're speaking at about a, mm, I don't know, over a 10 minute conversation or a five minute monologue. Um, that I think uh, is a good way for them to have a certain goal. And they know that goal, whether it's their goal or not, they know that that's the goal of the class. Now, the uh, second part of this, what's called a mean length run, that eight words are better. So I'll show you the definition of that. The idea of a mean length run is that that is the number of words, although normally by researchers is measured in syllables, but I make it easier for my, <coughs> pardon me, make it easier for my students by say words. Yeah, and some words are a word like immunization and some words are a, uh, but then you still fall in, in, in the general idea that a word is about, on average, about uh, three and a half, maybe two and a half syllables. So I say to my students, eight words are better. Can you say eight words all the way through without any kinds of ums or uhs? I mean, like, you know, so those kinds of filler words, gap words, uh, those are what are called disfluencies. Now, a second language speaker, if they can achieve a mean length run that eight words are better in a meaningful utterance. Okay, so you're not just saying things like chocolate, 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 chocolate. Uh, that's not really communicating that much, although it's obvious that you obviously have chocolate on your mind. If you can say a meaningful utterance and say it through eight words without pausing, without stopping, maintaining your pace 
and maintaining it at 110 to 120 words per minute, that is the other facet of fluency that is an important uh, target to be had. For example, when was the last time you had an entire group of students, not just you know, your one remarkable student, but an entire group of students come up to you and say, Mr. Cruz, is my homework due this week or next week? 11 words. And when was the last time they said this? Mr. Cruz, is my homework due this week or next week? It's 11 words. And I'm probably, I would be surprised if you had a lot of students that could do that because I don't have a lot of students that can do that at the university level. They can read that sentence. If I asked them to translate it, they could probably write that sentence. When it comes to standing up uh, at your lectern dais at the end of the class to ask that question, they probably pause and stop. They would be stopping in the middle of the sentence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is what fluency is about. Can you speak at a certain pace? Can you say things smoothly? Those two things are defined here. Speed and smoothness. Those are the two easiest words that you can say to your students. Those are the two, if you think about the problems that your kids who actually can start uttering English have, they speak slowly, okay? They make ideas slowly, they, they respond slowly. They know what they wanna say, but it just doesn't come out. And we've all had this problem. I'm sure we've all had this problem. For the ALTs, you have this problem in Japanese. For some of the JTEs, you had this problem at some point in your English learning. You weren't able to say the English quickly. The response took time to make and your ideas were not created uh, as quickly as you would have liked them to. Now that goes to a, a different theoretical discussion, which I hope to touch upon a little bit later, but basically those are the things that are important in speed. When it comes to smoothness, can you control the pace between your words and sentences so that like a good native speaker, sometimes if you want to, you can speak slowly. But then if you get really excited and you really wanna speak fast, you can do that too. That's the kind of control a good speaker of their own native language can achieve. And that's what our students, I think in their minds, the ones who really want to become good at speaking English, that's what they want to be able to do. But it's never been elucidated to them and it's never been told to them that it is achievable in steps and that it is actually a numerical goal that you can start sticking to. Now that I've made that uh, point about uh, what fluency is and where it should go, um, a little bit slower. Okay, I'll try to make that a little bit slower. Uh, 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 where was I? Oh yeah, so where will this go? Well, this presentation uh, is about structure, control, and verbal classrooms. This is the name of the uh, presentation itself and the name of this teaching style that I've been using for the past, well, since 1991, almost 29 years now. Oh no, sorry. I've been teaching since 1991. I've been doing SCVC after I was, um, I was given it uh, in its raw form back in 1995. And I started teaching it uh, in 1997 at university. It was originally designed as a, a short intensive course for freshmen uh, at um, Nippon Steel at Shinitetsu. And these freshmen back in 1995 would come into the company and they would be given these intensive courses in English because Nippon Steel at the time had a lot of extra money and uh, they brought in uh, English teachers to teach. And um, Christopher Dugdale and James Bolin, my two good friends at the company where I, English teaching company where I worked, told me about this teaching method, but it was designed to be done in an intensive for relatively mature adults of 23, 24 years old and to be, to be done in a two week or three week intensive environment. I had to take that and bring it to a university environment. And I hope someday that uh, now that I'm having the opportunity to speak to high school teachers, to, uh, to junior high school teachers, that um, it's something that can be brought to where I think it really needs to be brought. And that is to the, the, those two levels, junior high school and high school and uh, get them to start speaking more. So that then at university, we can start introducing them to even higher levels of speaking skills and maybe uh, start spreading this out to the country. What is structure control? Okay, 
The idea that you're going to be teaching students using these set sentence structures in a scaffolded manner. A scaffolding, uh, for those of you who might not know it, is the idea that you're taking one exercise and using that like a step or as a scaffold, you know, with the, with the painters and uh, people who work on houses, that's where you step to get to a higher level. So you take this one structure, you make sure that the, the students are already used to it and that uh, they, they understand it. And then you put another scaffold on top of that. So a slightly higher level of exercise and you just keep going until you get to your goal. And the goal is progressively complex and independent conversations. One thing that I want you to take away from this is that this has structure control in verbal classrooms, has an entire gamut of exercises that stretch across, if you want, a 64 week program, a 64 week university program, which I'm pretty sure because um, classes in Japan are shorter and there might be fewer of them uh, in terms of total minutes per student over a year, that that two-year program could probably be stretched out to cover a three-year program in high school, and maybe something can be done in junior high school to make an introductory level to this too. But right now, yes, it is primarily uh, the experience that I have and the materials that I have are for university. Now, the other half of this is verbal classrooms. So you take these structures, okay, and you put them in a classroom with 40 students and your first reaction, if you've never seen this before, is this isn't gonna work. These kids are shy, uh, they're, 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 they have a lot of trepidation about speaking English. And every time I ask them to start speaking, they basically start burying their heads in their books or bow down because they don't want to be called upon. And I understand your trepidation with the idea that speaking can be, can be brought into a large classroom with 40 students, uh, that they will all start speaking when you tell them to speak. But trust me, I'm going to show you video evidence of this among your uh, peers here. And one of them will be helping me with demonstrations a little bit later, uh, Jenny Crittenden. When she saw what I did, she uh, tried it in her own classroom and it was exactly the same reaction. When you say go, they start speaking. I don't want to jump too far ahead of myself, but a verbal classroom is the idea that you set up the environment. You, the instructor, are a very important part of that environment because you set the tone, you set the pace. They watch you for, their, for your body language cues, your verbal cues. Uh, you are the one elucidating to them that this is a different set of goals. This is a different way of teaching. This is going to be about teaching. It's not about grammar or vocabulary. It's not about complexity. It's about quantity. That's verbal classrooms. Now, before we get on to this, I know that you're already thinking about the disadvantages and the advantages uh, of all of this. So first, let's talk about what might be a disadvantage uh, for students. Okay. Now, there are a few of them, but the ones that I pointed out in yellow, I don't know if you can see that very well in the auditorium. I didn't know how big the auditoriums would be for some of you, but uh, I'll read it out. Okay. The one in yellow as a disadvantage up here, okay, where my cursor is, okay. it says, less connection to goals typical of Japanese style English instruction. Now, that is the case for me uh, teaching at a university. At a university, okay, um, these kids are told very, very often by their, their other teachers, their, their Japanese level teachers, uh, sorry, their Japanese language teachers, I'm sorry, the TOEIC, TOEIC, you have to get a TOEIC. Oh, not a TOEIC, okay, TOEFL. Well, okay, maybe IELTS. The tests are everything. And uh, I, really don't like tests. I, I, I don't think that um, they really tell you anything about your real skills, especially in language. I'm not saying the tests are something that should be abandoned, but they should be used to create a different kind of motivation. And if these kids don't see the connection between these speaking exercises and their connection at least to the final assessment of the class, which is another discussion that we'll have a little bit later, but they don't see the connection to the wider world that they're being encouraged to partake in. Uh, as Takahashi sensei mentioned in our first, um, in our, our opening, uh, uh, opening address, that we want to become global citizens. 
if we still keep telling them that it's only about tests, they're going to start thinking, why are we doing these speaking exercises if they're not going to help me improve my test scores? Now, that is something that is very, very important to bridge. And the basic idea is that if you really want to become good at taking tests and getting good test scores, you really should learn how to speak English. That's why you're going to be able to remember things. That's why you're going to be able to do things as a reflex, not about what you memorized the, the night before from your flashcards or from your textbooks. That'll be effective maybe for tomorrow's test, but you know it and I know it. If you don't actually learn how to speak, there is no way for you to remember this information um, two months later, four months later when you start forgetting all that stuff that you memorized. Okay. It also requires a little bit more energy, a little bit more participation and motivation, but all of those disadvantages can be uh, leapfrogged very, very easily with the right instruction in the right kind of environment. Uh, now, the advantages are huge. Okay, they're huge. Uh, the first one up here is addresses actual speaking skills even in mixed level classes. And I mean it, in mixed level classes, this actually helps um, a lot. Uh, for both sides, for the higher level students who are mixed in with lower level students. Uh, and, and it'll work fine if all the lower level students are actually grouped together and you stream the higher level students into another class. It still works very, very well if the teacher knows how to adjust. And the teacher has time to adjust because they're not bound by what they have to follow in the textbook. They're looking at their students. They're thinking, wow, these kids can handle this well. Let me turn the heat up a little bit. Or they're thinking, well, let me turn the heat down a little bit because they're having a little bit of trouble. Little bit of trouble. Let me do this practice with them one more time. But instinctively, especially kids at junior high school, they know that language is speaking. And sometimes I really do think some of the reasons why they lose their motivation is because this is first year junior high school and all I'm doing is studying vocabulary and grammar. And yeah, you know, uh, talking to the ALT is really fun, but that's not what I'm being tested for. And they keep telling me to take the ACAN and, uh, I, and I don't have to do anything, uh, worry about speaking until I get to the higher levels of ACAN. You start losing your motivation for speaking. Go through another year of junior high school and the grammar and the vocabulary gets even harder and the amount of speaking time doesn't really change. The, they want to learn how to speak instinctively. And I think part of the motivation loss that they, that they suffer is because instinctively they know what is important, but they're not being given that much time to do it. Okay? But this uh, SCVC maximizes their speaking time. All of the time in the classroom, in my class, it's what I do. All of that time is spent speaking, speaking, and speaking. Um, when I was dealing with higher level students in university back maybe about 20 years ago, there was a way that I could take my higher level students and for the 90 minutes, seriously, from the chime to the, at the start to the chime at the end, their mouths were moving all the way through the class. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. I don't do that anymore because I don't know if you've noticed it, but at university we've noticed it since about 1995 to now, over these 25 years, English skill has actually gone down. Uh, we've noted that at university quite clearly. Move on here. Okay, now for the teachers, okay, uh, there are disadvantages, but again, the advantages far outweigh it. And here's where I think it's important for you as JTEs, so to speak specifically to the JTEs. This is a viable method for non-native but fluent instructors. And I say but fluent but you can take out that but fluent. You don't, you don't actually have to be fluent to teach this. What you do have to do is be, you have to be very honest with your students about whatever level of English that you're at. You have to show them that even at your level of English, that this is something that will help you and them as students, that you, if you do your team teaching well with the ALT, that you can work together to show that your English doesn't have to be already perfect to get to the point where you can start speaking, that you can speak English even at uh, whatever level that you have, at the student's level, the highest student's level, the ALT's level. There are bad English speakers and there are great English speakers, but they are all English speakers. And once you start speaking English at whatever level, you are technically an English speaker. If you can get that message to the students, 
and you get them to understand that you as a JTE can actually do this with them. And, and it doesn't mean that you're a perfect speaker, but you can do the exercises well. And then you do it well with the ALT, you two practice before you go into the classroom. Your students will be much more motivated, I really do believe. So here are the, the goals for the, for the method. You want to maximize student speed and output quantity. The quantity they speak, not the quality. And that's a really hard idea to shake at first. Oh, I want them to speak well. Well, we taught them that grammar. Oh no, don't make that mistake in grammar again. I just taught you that. Get that out of your head, okay? These students are going to make mistakes. You're going to show them uh, uh, even what you think is the simplest, and there are some very simple exercises I'm about to show you. The simplest exercise, don't get it into the, your head that they have to be perfect from the very beginning, okay? And that you, you can't go on to the next thing until everybody is, is perfect. That's, that's just not the case. You go on when you think, it's a, a mixture of factors. They're starting to get really good at it, uh, that you spent enough time, that you have a series of other goals in the class that you have to hit. But it, it is not required of the students to actually be perfect, especially in pronunciation. Although well, pronunciation is important, but that's not important. Uh, pronunciation, uh, just to tell you really quickly, uh, there is way too much uh, emphasis on getting these kids to pronounce well to the point where they start being, becoming too shy of their English because they're constantly being told their pronunciation is bad. You have to get them to the point of thinking, your pronunciation must, might be bad, but if I can understand you, it is good enough. Your pronunciation washes out. If you can maintain this quantity, you keep speaking a lot of English, your pronunciation will improve. If you keep targeting pronunciation and limit your speaking to a certain level to the words you can only pronounce well, your pronunciation will degrade. It will not improve, even if you can hit the pronunciation of that word just this one time. You set your practice uh, to focus on student focus, to, uh, sorry, student focus on fluency and then idea of production, okay? Um, sorry, just uh, not seeing it. Okay, uh, so let's, let's move on a little bit ahead here. Uh, uh, I, I was trying to give you a, a little bit uh, more of this, but let me uh, go on. Uh, to, the, uh, to the presentation itself. Helping students realize that complexity and accuracy cannot be permanently achieved without fluency. Maybe we'll come back to this stuff later after I've shown you what it actually looks like in a classroom, okay? Okay, so before I show you the video, this is what we're going to be doing in the classroom. This is a, the basic seven pronouns from I to they, I, you, he, she, it, we, they, okay? And those are paired with the verb to be. Now the verb to be is an irregular verb, so it has different conjugations depending on the, uh, the pronoun in the present tense. This is a very basic practice in French, very basic practice in Spanish, and it's not such a basic practice in English, but because as a Canadian, this is something that uh, I picked up for my French studies, this is how I begin teaching my students uh, in a classroom. This is a video, we're gonna be watching a video of me from a demonstration class that I did uh, 2015, 2016, 2015, sorry, 2015. And at that time, I gathered 20 students, some of them were my own, who yes, had done this before a little bit, okay? But the majority of them, 18 of them out of the 20, had never seen me do this before. I wanted to make sure that I was doing this with students who had never done this before so I could get their natural reactions uh, recorded and videotaped. And these students, of course, have signed model releases. They, uh, they know that they're being recorded, so there's no privacy issue here. So let's watch this video. It'll go for about two and a half minutes, and you can watch me start to introduce what I do to the students. My teacher wrote this up for me. Oh, gosh, no, what is that? That's uh, 46 years ago? Holy cow. Okay, uh, when I first went to Canada. And and one day she said, Jose, stand up, say all of this in a big, loud, fast voice. And I would stand up and I would say, I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Very good, two times, faster, louder. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Now, I bet if I asked one of you right now to do that, you couldn't. 
And you are university students who've studied English for six years. Just goes to show you, all the studying you do doesn't get you ready for speaking. So we're going to speak today. First thing we're going to do, I want you to turn around in your chairs 90 degrees. Turn around, 90 degrees. Turn around and face your partner on that side. Just, no, turn around in your chair. Yeah, just turn around in your chair. You don't have to turn the chair. Just turn around in your chair. Good, OK, there you go. Good, OK. And this is what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how to do this with you. Okay. Take it from the first line. Somebody, when I say, ready, go, first line, okay. you will, I, I'll go with I am. You'll begin with you are, and I'll continue with he is, she is, and we'll continue from there. When we get to the bottom, we go back to the top. Ready? I'll start. I am. Uh, you are. He is. She. It is. Look at me. Look they at me. are. They are. I am. You are. He is. She is. It is. We are. They are. I am. You he are. is. She it is. We are. Did it over here, over here, over here. <laughs> Very difficult, yeah? Yes. But it looks so easy, yeah? Because yeah. looking at something in English, studying it on paper is nowhere near as difficult as looking at somebody in the eyes. So it's okay. If you want to look at this, go ahead, take a look. You can check the order, you can check whatever it is you want, but when you speak to a person, learn to go from paper to a person's eyes. Look all you want, but when your mouth moves, you go back to the person. Okay, when I say ready, go, somebody begins. Look at your partners. Ready, go! Okay, I'm going to turn off my slides for a moment here. And uh, Deanna, we're going to try that great experiment where uh, we're going to be moving people into breakout rooms. So maybe if you could give me the host uh, for a little while, I think that would be good. Uh, that is probably what I should have shown you at the very beginning, I realize. I'm sorry if you uh, didn't quite understand all of that theoretical discussion that I, that I had for you. But I, trust me, from here on in, we get to the really good parts of what I wanted to talk about today. Because now I'm going to be talking about this method. Um, and I emphasize again that when I, when I do this with any class, whether it's this model class or any of my university classes, that was the very first time I told those students, okay, ready, go. They all immediately started speaking. And it is the same reaction. It is that first moment that you're very afraid uh, because you've been speaking to me for the past uh, couple of weeks about this and you wanna do it in your classroom. And I tell you, don't worry, they will. As soon as you say go, they will start speaking. Um, that moment, when they start speaking, that is a re revelation for almost all of the people that I've helped bring this into their classroom. They will start speaking that way. Uh, speaking of somebody that actually has started teaching this in her classroom, I'd like to ask um, uh, Jenny Crittenden uh, to turn on uh, her camera, thank you, and her microphone. Just quickly, Jenny. Um, your experience with this, if you could just encapsulate it, the very first time you did it, uh, how was it? Uh, noisy, but great. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, okay. the students were really into it. Yeah, she agrees. And uh, yeah, they had a lot of fun doing it. Okay. Um, and I know that, you know, a lot of people will go, what, really? But... And yeah, uh, trust me, uh, you're, you're going to be trying with each other. You're going to be surprised at the noise in the room that you're in. Now, I'm told that some of you here are assembled in large rooms, okay? And some of you here are assembled, like uh, Crittenden says it there, with her JCP. So for those of you who have someone next to you uh, already there as a partner, okay, I'm not going to be asking you to go into breakout rooms. But unfortunately, I'm um, thinking about breakout rooms. To put you into breakout rooms, I don't really know who is with a partner or who is not, okay? So I'm going to be trying to, looking, trying to look at the breakout rooms and to see who is alone uh, in a room and, and, and not uh, talking to anyone. Uh, and I'm going to try to be moving you into breakout rooms, okay? Now, a breakout room, if you don't know, is a smaller Zoom meeting basically where you're not in with the main group, you're there only with one or two other Zoom accounts. And I'm going to try within the two minutes that we're doing this, or sorry, the first one is one minute, 
in the one minute to try to find the people who can uh, be moved into another room so they have someone to practice with for the total of it, okay? But let me go back to my screen share here. Come on. And I will show you the diagram uh, that uh, I showed you before. So this is what I want uh, Jenny to help me with. So this is what I would do with this, the, like I did in that video with that one student. Demonstration is very important. Don't just tell them what you're going to be doing. You show them. If you feel that a demonstration with the second student is important, I'm going to be showing you the seat switching. Okay. And you can do that with every student that, uh, that comes along to you. Basically, it'll go like this. Okay. One line for me, next line for the student, or in this case, Jenny. When we get to the bottom, we go back up to the top until I say stop. We ready, Jenny? Sure. I am. You are. He is. He is. It is. We are. They are. I am. You are. He is. He is. It is. Now. She is. Yeah. Now, in this case, it is very hard in a virtual setting to actually create the kind of physical mm, rhythm where you're making the students feel the pressure of a higher speed, high response conversation at its lowest, lowest level. A lot of these students actually do understand English well, but they've never been given the challenge of being able to come up with it in a high speed situation. So they're given just these very simple structures and you as a teacher start bringing up the pace as I did with that boy in the glasses. Uh, and he feels the pressure himself. Looks easy, but it's actually very hard if you try to do it fast. Okay, so uh, I'm going to turn off my share and I'm going to a, go into a great experiment where I'm going to be uh, looking at breakout rooms. Now, how many people do I have here? Uh, 85, okay. So uh, I actually, Deanna, are you there? I am indeed. Do you have any idea, just a rough number of how many people are sitting alone with their device? Perhaps fewer than 20. Fewer than 20. Okay, I'm gonna have to make a guess here and I'm gonna make um, 10 breakout rooms so that then we have enough for those approximately 20 people to get into the groups of 10, I'm sorry, to, go, to get into groups of two or three. And again, I'm going to be trying to move you around, okay? Uh, but if you end up in a room by yourself, uh, I'm sorry, but it's just the, one of the limitations of Zoom and the limitations of this experience where I don't really know who's alone. Uh, although maybe now in retrospect, I should have probably gotten everyone to rename themselves and put in a little bracket that says parenthesis alone parenthesis, and then I would know who um, would or wouldn't go into a breakout room. We'll try that a little bit later. But uh, my apologies if you end up in a room alone and you're not able to, uh, to present presenters. So we can put up our hands if we are in pairs. Um, put you in pairs. Pairs, you mean pairs with someone physically? Uh, Kurate SHS son? Yes, okay. Um, well, okay, here's my first, my first idea, okay? If you're in an auditorium, okay, don't worry about it. You don't have a choice. You can't go into a breakout room. If you are in a small group or you're in a pair sitting in a room, okay, when the breakout room button appears on your screen, don't push it. Instead, just start practicing this. Uh, I'll show you the slide one more time. And if you can remember it or write it down, I'll give you a chance to write it down right now, okay? For those of you in the auditorium, please remember this. It shouldn't be that hard to remember. It is the seven basic pronouns, I, you, he, she, it, we, they. Okay, matched up with B in the present tense. Try to remember that, okay? Because I'm gonna be asking you to work with the person, okay, immediately to your left, okay? That person to your left, okay, um, uh, from, okay, from the right-hand side, just tap a person on your left to say, you're my partner. So everybody start choosing your partners right now. If you're in an auditorium, pair up and make sure that you've got someone on the pair and you both know that you're in your pair. If there is an odd man out near you uh, and you feel that you're an odd man out, please tell someone and uh, get into a group of three with the nearest pair, okay? 
I know that we have to practice social distancing, so please remember to keep your voice up. That room is going to get really loud. Now, for the people who are alone on a device, I'm going to be creating breakout rooms, OK, of, let's say, 10. And I will try to keep an eye on the people that are um, alone in their rooms, OK, and uh, see uh, if I can work that. And I'll ask for your feedback after this first one. This is all a big experiment. Uh, I've, I've never done anything like this before. So hey, great experience for me. But basically, I'm going to start. Oh, I got to put this down to one minute. Yeah, it's ready for one minute. OK, 10 seconds to come back. Now, when I open the rooms, OK, go ahead and start doing I am, you are, he is with the person who is next to you or the person in the room with you. If you're in the breakout rooms, I'm going to try to go as fast as I can to put as many people as I can into rooms by themselves. OK, so let's see how this goes. Good luck. When the minute is over, everybody will come back uh, and I'll close the breakout rooms. OK, so when I say ready, go, just start doing it with the person or the people that you've designated in your groups. OK, ready, go. OK, stop, stop. OK, now. Uh, I'll take a quick survey, okay, because I want to know how um, everyone thought. Did that, for the people who ended up in breakout rooms because they were alone, do you think that that will be okay if we continue doing it that way? If you think that it's okay to continue doing it the way I just did it, could you raise your hand, please, in the participants list? There's a raise hand button at the bottom of the list. Uh, it's a blue button on the bottom left-hand corner. If you thought that that was a good enough way to do it, then we'll continue doing it that way. Otherwise, we'll try to figure out a better way. Jose, can I interrupt? Yes, Jenny. Um, I know that at least in the room that I popped into, that they had no time to actually really do anything. They just popped into the room, so. Okay, yeah, unfortunately, if I give them that much time, then, well, we can try it for two minutes. How about that? You think two minutes? I think that would help. And then we'll, uh, we'll do that uh, with the people in the auditorium too. Okay, so, uh, well, this might actually start working. It worked better than I thought it would. All righty, so let's get back to my share. That was the first one, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna take a look at the chat to see if anyone, where's the chat here, there it is. Anyone wanted to make a comment or anything like that? Uh, oh, and Deanna, have any uh, questions popped up? You currently don't have any questions. I think everyone's very engaged with your presentation. Okay. It takes some time to load the rooms and calibrate. I understand. Yes. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, there are limitations to this software, uh, and um, I'll try to work with it. And if you have any suggestions, um, please keep putting them in there. Interesting activity. I'll try it. Okay. Well, wait. We're, we're not even anywhere near it yet, but uh, just wait until it gets actually get, gets really good. Um, okay. So that was just one thing. Now, what I want you to notice is when I said go, at least in the auditoriums, probably everybody went. And I don't really know exactly where this comes from. I would like to talk to the originator of the method, but unfortunately he left Japan and I can't contact him. Um, he left Japan 20 years ago. But where he got the idea that, you know, you could ring a Pavlovian bell and say, dinner time and the dog starts drooling. I know you're not drooling, but when I said go, you all went. And uh, it's still, uh, in its way, a mystery to me. Okay, so let's take that, okay? And just like I would do with the students, now let's put an object on there. It's an, an adjective, sleepy, okay? And you can do this, this is particularly fun if you do this for first period, because the kids are sleepy. And uh, you can just take this, and now you've actually increased the, the sentence length by 50%, from two words to three words. Jenny, can you um, open up your your uh, microphone again sure and um let's see if uh, we can go on with this real fast too ready i'm sleepy you're sleepy he is sleepy she is sleepy it is sleepy we are sleepy they are sleepy i am sleepy you are sleepy he is sleepy and um thank you and um even though jenny and i are going very fast and we're, we're very good at this you will find that most of your students can probably achieve that same level of speed but unfortunately, I got to say, after you know, a semester and a half of teaching virtually using Zoom, it just is not as fun as being able to do it in the classroom with all of the students hearing all of their friends' voices, feeding back on that. Um, 
feeling the energy in the classroom. I almost envy you uh, because this method works best face to face. And even though you know, I feel a little bit safer in terms of my personal safety against the virus, being able to teach at home, um, this method really is something that uh, is to be taken advantage of in the classroom. Okay, is everybody good with this one? I am sleepy. You just take sleepy, and put that at the end of the same conjugations you were doing before. Okay, we're gonna go back into breakout rooms, okay? And um, once you get in, once you push that button, the first person who gets in, okay, is the first person to begin with I am sleepy. So when the second person comes in, don't make any introductions. Don't, don't start with anything like, uh, don't, don't waste any of that time, okay? And just go straight into it. If a third person comes in, just put them into the group, okay? There's, a, there's obviously an order going and just put them into the group. Don't waste too much time on negotiations. Just uh, go straight into it. Okay, well, let me uh, stop that. So let's keep going. Okay, you can also go on with the negative, okay? Because these kids, even though intellectually you tell them the negative is this, okay, you just basically take not, and with a, a basic verb like this, a grammatical verb like be, they just put not right up uh, to the right-hand side of the verb. They've never said it. There are kids in your class who have literally been taking notes for the past two months and have never said any of these words. It's quite possible. And so this might be the very first time. And, and when it comes out of their mouths and they realize, wow, that's exactly what I wanted to say, that raises their motivations. Their voice is coming into their ears. Their friends' voices are coming to their ears. But another great advantage of it is their voice, they realize this, their voice is not really that audible. The energy of the entire room is coming into their ears, but no individual student in a high energy classroom like this is is picked upon, not, not that you're picking on your students, but it's but is chosen to have their voice in their mind psychologically boom out to the entire classroom and all of its mistakes and all of its bad pronunciation, which it probably isn't. But to a student, that's, that's a great fear that they have. And they want to practice, but they don't want to be subjected to that. So here's the environment where they can do that. The other students can't hear them. They can hear themselves. They can just hear that person across from them but they, they can now start to practice English without worrying about it. Uh, have a, may I answer this question, Deanna? I haven't read it, but um, may I answer this? Of course. All right, uh, let's see. How did you decide what kinds of phrases to use? We had pronouns, V verb. Uh, how do we decide what other ones to use in our lessons? Okay, um, that's a very good question. Basically, you start, uh, a really good place to start a story is always at the beginning, okay? You start from the beginning. The most basic grammatical structures that you have basically are statements. I am, I think, therefore I am. So I am, the most basic statement you can make. And this begins with uh, taking on adjectives. I choose the be verb because it's very easy to put all kinds of adjectives that they probably have been studying from first year junior high school. Sleepy, hungry, uh, Japanese, I am not. Canadian, I am not Chinese. And then that is a very easy place to start tagging on other forms of grammar. From there, and this is also another discussion, it really can depend on what your textbook wants to teach. And there is, I think, a lot more need than it, there is for me as a university teacher. There's a lot more need for you as ALTs and JTEs to be able to tie this in with the textbook that they might be using in other classes. What I suggest is that you look at the textbook that you're going to be using with these kids, maybe the grammar book that they're using in a special grammar class, and look at those phrases and think about how you can adapt it to this using the seven pronouns, the basic verbs. You can also go from here. I don't know if, uh, if it's the next slide. Yeah, there it is. It is the next slide. You can go to the past tense, okay? Uh, but uh, let's go. Let's. I, I don't want to jump too far ahead. I basically, to answer your question, I... I start from the very beginning and the sentences get progressively more difficult, not just in terms of grammar, but in terms of length. And they're always trying to be able to say those sentences all the way through without stopping. And I'm going to show you a video where I actually show that a little bit later, but let's go back to this one. Okay, uh, for those of you who remember, I'm going to be putting this up 
on the uh, screen. But for those of you in breakout rooms, especially if you're going to a breakout room, you might want to write this down or remember it in your head. Uh, this is what I keep telling the students. Come on, there's only seven pronouns. I, you, he, she, it, we, they. There are only seven pronouns, okay? I, you, he, she, it, we, they. Please remember them, okay? Your, 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 your uh, cell phone number is 11 uh, numbers, and you can remember that. So please remember, I, you, he, she, it, we, they. Uh, to be negative, not hungry. I am not hungry. But I'm going to demonstrate this. So Jenny, um, if I can get you to demonstrate this with me. Sure. Okay. Uh, ready? Mm. I'm not hungry. You're not hungry. He's not hungry. She's not hungry. It's not hungry. It's not hungry. No, We're it, not hungry. It's a, <laughs> they're not hungry. I'm not hungry. You're not hungry. He's not hungry. Now, we had just a very, very interesting moment right there where, um, and I've done this before when I was able to do this in team teaching, where you flub. And do not be afraid or do not expect that you will be able ever be able to do this without ever making one single mistake in front of your students. How you handle that first flub, okay, uh, is very important. You show the humor in the moment. You tell them that, you know, speaking is a skill and even the best, uh, the best athletes at their best sport will have bad days and good days. Sometimes they literally trip over their shoelaces. Uh, so that is just something that you must understand. You have been brought up thinking that the only way that you speak English is perfect, that there are no, uh, as they say, sankaku, there are no triangles for you. There is only uh, X's or, or circles. But in English, there are way more exceptions than there are rules. Okay, so everybody okay with this? I'm gonna try it again. I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms. Now, in the auditorium, sorry, let me just um, make myself a bit bigger here. Thank you, by the way, Jenny. In the auditorium, okay, turn to the other person in the other direction. If you turn to your left, this time, turn to your right, uh, tap a person on the shoulder and say, yeah. and make sure that you're paired up. Uh, if you're the odd man out, maybe choose a different pair just so then you can hear other voices. Uh, or maybe if you were the odd man out before, try to get into a pair this time out. So it's a different thing, working in threes or working in pairs. So I'm hoping that everybody in their auditoriums, individual auditoriums are now ready with their new uh, groupings or with their new pairs. And I'm going to be setting people into breakout rooms again. Okay, uh, let's see. I don't think I have any notifications about any problems. Okay, so uh, two minutes again. Okay, and when I hit the breakout rooms, uh, I'm going to also say go and uh, just get ready to go with uh, I am not hungry. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, everybody stop there. Um, let's see. Nogata SHS, I believe. Uh, yeah, can this be done with vocabulary only? Mm. I suppose you could. There's, um, there's a, a practice I, I have called word throw, uh, which is an advanced practice because it's designed to take the students from a certain point where they've already done a lot of SCVC and get them ready for individual uh, um, um, group, uh, individual, I'm sorry, for group conversations for the assessment. It can be done. I wouldn't recommend that it be done because one thing about doing it with vocabulary only, it is actually more difficult than doing it with sentences. Because if you do it with just a word, your brain has to keep searching for a new word, which is actually more work than focusing on repeating the same cycle of set uh, 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 pronouns and verbs. If you try it yourself, like, um, I don't know, Jenny, are you there? Yes. Uh, you've done word throw? No? A little bit, but not much. Okay. Um, so basically, I'm going to show you here. I'm going to, because it's hard for me. Um, Jenny might be better at it than me. She might have had more coffee than I've had today. Um, and I'm going to say one English word. Okay. Now, maybe it will be a stack of words uh, that um, will be on a list, and that list will be provided to the students. But in my university, I tell them any English word doesn't have to have any kind of meaning or connection, and your partner will be doing the same. But you cannot repeat a word you've already said. If your partner says it, you cannot repeat what your partner said. It always has to be a new word every time. Okay. So Jenny, you ready for this? Sure. Okay. Uh, kitchen. Door. Table. Bag. Knife. Keyboard. Uh, pasta. Noodles. Uh, oven. Dope. Uh, 
a, a, a mixer. Label. You notice how it starts to get harder? Like, I, I don't know if Jenny had time to think about it, but it starts to get harder as you start to go on with this, right? Would you agree? Yeah, because hmm. you're also thinking of all the words that were said before. Exactly. So you can do this with just, thank you, Jenny. You can do this with just vocabulary only, but I wouldn't throw that in too early. Okay, and um, Deanna, I'm gonna ask you to start curating these questions because they seem to be coming at me fast and furious. And uh, maybe we can uh, go over them towards the end or something uh, specific that looks like it's time sensitive. You can ask me right now. Is there any- Jose, I'm trying to answer them from my own experience for you oh, as well. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and then and Jenny, maybe you can tell me, is there anything that um, I need to answer right now? Uh, no, the main thing is just the idea that yes, with Nogata, it's better to do it in sentences than to use vocab only. With Munakata, it's okay to do them as one-offs. You don't have to make it an entire curriculum, but just getting the kids the exposure to speaking. I've done that. It works. It's fine. The students came away from it really happy and enjoying speaking and feeling a bit more confident. So, I wish I had the chance to edit um, Pritin Sensei's uh, video that she showed me of her students. And uh, for those of you who still might be thinking, but is that really going to work in my classroom? Yes, it really works in your classroom. They were standing up. They were speaking at a much louder volume than they're used to. It's an effect of the verbal classrooms. To be able to hear each other and to get over the din of the whole room, they have to start speaking up. And they start feeling English coming from their bellies, where before they was just kind of coming from their noses and their throats. Yes. And, and live audience. The person who just asked that question, yes, because it takes the entire class when I've done it or part of the class, you constantly switch it. You add different words, you change the words. So I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, I am not Japanese, I'm not American, I'm not English, blah, 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 blah. You just keep changing it up and it you do it in very short bursts and it works. They and just you have it. a plan. Sorry, Jenny. You have yeah. a plan. You, you know where you want these 45 minutes or where you want, in my case, these 70 minutes, 80 minutes to end. And you want to end on a high note. You want to end showing them, wow, you, you finished that 11 word sentence really well and e almost everybody did it. Wow, you learned how to do questions. So let's go on to the material. Um, there's a lot of questions there that I think we'll, we'll, we'll put a lot of time in. It's 11.30 now, but we'll, we'll try to finish up the less of these slides and uh, answer a lot of those questions as we go. Okay. So I'm gonna start skipping some of these because you can imagine what they're like. We've already done a lot of them, okay? Um, I was in Osaka. Now you have a new preposition, in Osaka. Oh dear, okay. Now how about this one? I was in Osaka last week. Now what is that happens there? I was in Osaka last week. You're at six words. This is gonna start stressing some of these kids out because in Osaka last week, you're going up, that's two, four, six, Every time you're going up by, you're doubling, I'm sorry, by uh, you're doubling at one point and 50%, two words at a time. They've never said six words at a time. And they're going to start getting these fluencies. I was in uh, Osaka last week. And then you encourage them to take that. Think of it as a, a six words. Think of it as one long word. I was in Osaka last week. I'm going to show you a particular uh, 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 a slogan that I have called one idea, one breath a little bit later, but you can keep going. I was in Osaka last week for job hunting. Now, of course, a junior high school student wouldn't uh, say that, but you could say something like, I was in Osaka last week for a kendo tournament. Perfectly easy for a junior high school student to imagine that happening. Now, we're going to go on to the next stage of what is difficult for these kids to do, which is to ask questions, to explain English question grammar is very simple. Okay, basically take the subject verb, okay? Switch it around, go verb subject. But when you team it up with a normal verb, like let's say go, I go, uh, I, I went to Osaka last week for a kendo tournament, that becomes much more difficult in the question form because the question form in English for regular verbs needs do as the question verb grammar. We know how hard that is to actually, uh, or, or sorry, we know how easy that is to explain, but especially the JTEs, you know that that's hard to actually fluently make come out reflexively with automaticity, as de Kaiser says, to make it uh, a, a reflexive skill 
that I don't even think about. I have a question in my head and it comes out by itself. How do you get there? With repetition and practice, with repetition and practice. I was watching, um, I'm a big fan of Marvel movies and I was watching Doctor Strange last night on TV, uh, on, my, on my TV. And um, basically that was what um, one of the characters asked another character, how do you become really good at something? And the answer was years of repetition and practice. Well, uh, hopefully it doesn't become years, but let's take a look at this uh, video that I, of me in the same class, explaining how I want the kids to do questions. I have a very crazy way of doing this practice. Person starts, I go. When you make the question, you make it with the subject next in order. So if your answer was, I go, your question will use you. I go, do you go? Your answer to this question uses the same subject, which then takes the next this question uses this answer, which then takes the next subject, and so on and so on. It looks hard, but actually, once you start doing it, it starts getting pretty easy. Well, let's take this slowly. Do you have any questions, dear? No. Okay, so I'll go slowly. I go, do you go? Hmm? I go, do you go? Uh, you go, does he go? Good. He goes, does she go? She goes. Do we go? Next one after she. Uh, does it go? It goes. Do we go? We go. Do they go? They go. Do I go? I. You go. Hmm? I, they go. <laughs> do I go? I go. Do you go? You go. Does he go? He goes. Very good. Do your best. Ready? Go. You can look, but when you speak, you speak to my eyes. Ready? I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, does she go? She goes, does, uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? Uh, we go, da, do they go? Good, do your best. Ready, go! I go, do you go? You go, does he go? I also uh, wanted you, I hope you noticed, pardon me, how they switched seats. Now I can show you a little bit of a diagram later. Basically they're moving against each other. So the, the kid who just did the demonstration, he moves into the next row and then the kids follow up behind him. The kid opposite him moves to the opposite side of him and they all move like a big snake across the room. Uh, so that's how you make sure these kids always have somebody that they're paired up with that's a little bit different. Um, let me show you the next slide so you can start getting ahead on what we're doing. Uh, and by the way, just to finish my point about uh, making sure they have different partners. Now there's no need to say, okay, find a partner that you can work with. And it takes forever to get them to like stand up and then finally find a friend or they don't have any friends yet. So they're really shy and you've got to move them around. And then when you want them to find a new partner, it takes again, another five minutes. It's all randomized. It's all automated. You say switch, they move to the next chair and they're ready to go. The seat switching takes maybe tops. 10 or 15 seconds tops. And that's if there's a problem. Usually it takes five seconds and you're ready to go to the next thing. So keep this in mind, okay? We're going back to the B verb because it's a lot easier than go, but the pattern itself, the hard part is moving from the statement to the question. Let me explain that the key is to follow that yellow line. So when I say ready, go, if you're all in breakout rooms or you're all in the auditorium, oh, by the way, start pairing up with each other if you can. You will begin from the same place, I am. It's the first place where everybody begins. 
but this time one person or one group's uh, um, uh, what they their utterance will consist of a statement and a question. I am. Now the subject following I will be used in the question. I am. Subject following I is you, so it becomes I am. Are you? Okay. So that you're using two different subjects from the statement to the question. Now, the answer will take the subject that was used in the question and use that as the answer for the, that question. So if you were asked, are you, then you will answer, you are. And I know that's not conversational, but this is still just a practice. And it is better than switching it over to I am, am I, you are, are you, he is, is he. That's totally non-conversational. But if you can just get past the first two pronouns, it becomes conversational, okay? It becomes you are, is he? And then the answer to is he is, he is, is she? Which then becomes conversational. And then it becomes a lot more conversational in that sense. Yes. The first two pronouns are a little bit weird because you're answering are you with you are. But just get your head around that. The rest of it actually becomes more about the speed, the speed of the response, getting them to learn to utter as soon as the question ends. Those are the important things in this. So Jenny, if you could open up and we can try this out. Good to go? I am. Are you? You are. Is he? He is. Is she? She is. Is it? It is. Are we? We are. Are they? They are. Am I? I am. Are you? You are. Is he? He is. Is she? She is. Is it? It is. is are we? Good. And slowly, 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 you, you feel out your audience. They, if they look like they're bright eyed and ready to challenge something, you can turn up the speed a bit. If it looks like there's still a little trepidation, little hesitation in their eyes, keep it slow. Keep it to the point where you're encouraging something called the no fail scenario. You do not want to give these kids a challenge where their potential for failure begins to approach their potential for success. You must scaffold these things so that their potential for success is far higher as a group than their potential for failure. And that's why you know, saying things like, well, what if you switch out the, the adjective so that one kid has to say hungry and another kid has to say sleepy, the, the no fail scenario collapses at that point. The whole point is to try to trip each other up and then somebody will fail. And yeah, that's kind of the part of a game, but here you're trying to encourage the idea that they're all gonna walk together, you're all going to succeed together, and that there will be very little failure, certainly very little public failure. So the things like the word throw, uh, making things more difficult. This first class is very important. You have to show that you're on their side, that you know how they feel about their trepidation to speak, that they will not be put into an any kind of embarrassing situation, but they will be speaking English, but at higher and higher levels. Okay, um, I'm pretty sure we don't have any questions about procedures, so I think we're ready to go ahead. Jenny, Deanna? Uh, two things. Will you share these slides with them, since that was a question? I will share these slides on the, on, with the auditorium audience, and fortunately with the breakout room audience, okay? No, 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 I mean like after. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, I will. I will give you my email address, and the email address itself can be used. Otherwise, I will make sure to uh, contact uh, Deanna uh, and maybe somehow send a group email for a link to download these from Google Drive. And uh, you can get them there. And certainly you can uh, contact me by email. And I just want to make a note about the questions. For those of you who work at what we consider lower academic schools, the, the students will look at you like you are insane when you show them this. They will. They really do. They're like, no, we can't. That's impossible. But they can and they do. They really do. You just have to hold their hand a bit more to begin with, but they get there and they figure it out. So, I would even encourage you to show videos. Uh, I have an entire YouTube playlist, which I will also show, and you can show those. Um, but this is where the team teaching aspect really works. If the JTE and the ALT can get together, 
and maybe even with a little bit of mimicry, you know, really drop the level and show how difficult it is. When I'm demonstrating these, and the kids can tell, of course I tell them my name, I'm a native speaker. Well, they know that. But when I'm doing the demonstrations, I demonstrate as if I am one of them. So I, I, I don't demonstrate as if it's me, the university professor. I demonstrate as if I'm one of the students. So I would actually say, I am. Are you? You are. Is he? He is. Is she? She is. Is it? A little bit of acting here. But you show them what they're going to look like. And you show them that it's OK to look like that. And you can do that, as uh, Jenny said, with the, with, the, with the junior high school students. Don't go into the higher aspects of it. Remember the no-fail scenario. You're the best arbiter of what your students can handle. Don't give them too much more that they need to bite off. OK? OK, I think we're ready to go, eh, Jenny? Yeah. OK, so we're going to go into breakout rooms. The auditorium, you can keep this as a reference. But also remember when I tell my students, don't look at this when your mouth is moving. Okay, You can look at it all you want, but when you're ready to speak, go back to the person's eyes. If you got to go back to this slide, that's okay. okay. But teach these kids that talking to a piece of paper, talking to a projector screen is not the same thing as talking to this person's eyes. If that takes a long time to build, that's fine. That's you. But that is your goal. OK, so we're going to go to these breakout rooms now. So, And um, I am told, or I realize that um, I can't believe it is already uh, 1130, what, 7, 36? And I, I'm only literally halfway through this because it, it takes a long time to, to answer questions and stuff. So I'm going to start uh, turning off the, uh, the breakout rooms. OK, and I'm just going to be trying to explain to you what I wanted to show you. Uh, and I can probably do that in about 10 minutes. OK, so you progress from I am, are you, to I do, do you. You do, does he, he does, does she, she does, does it, it does, do we, we do, do they. And at a certain point, you're going to be able to do as fast as I can, even if you think that your English isn't that good. Why? Because you've been focusing on this skill. So even if you do speak with a bit of a stutter, maybe a, a little bit of broken English, uh, it's fine. Because you're showing these kids that this is a skill that they're studying. You then move on to regular verbs, as I showed in that one video with go or have. I have, do you have, he has, does she have. This third person, um, this third person conjugation, third person present with the S sound where it is, that is a problem that these kids will have for the longest time because. Up to now, they've only thought about these verbs in their infinitive form, and they've never had any real practice actually saying them uh, in, their, uh, in their conjugated forms. So you're going you're gonna to hear that problem a lot. How strict you are about it, uh, that's up to you if you think that that's something that they should be strict about. Me, I let it go a lot. I certainly let it go during the test. If they're being communicative, if they're being fluent, remember my definition of fluent, I let that stuff go. But I tell them that's not really the, the best English grammar. You have to say he has, not he have. Then it starts getting longer. And this is where it starts getting to the point where you can start throwing grammatical structures in. This is what I call a double variable conjugation. Okay. Now, if we had more time, this is where I wanted to actually end to show you how hard this is to do at speed. Because you have to think about the I have, do you have, plus now you have to make sure that my is properly inserted into the sentence. Now, you understand this on an intellectual level, but to be able to do it at speed requires practice. Jenny, can you turn on your camera? Sure. OK, ready, ready with this? Uh, are, we, are we doing the double? Yeah, OK. Double variable, yep. Ready? Mm. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? You have Netflix on your phone. Does he have Netflix on his phone? He has Netflix on his phone. Does she have Netflix on her phone? She has Netflix on her phone. Does it have Netflix on its phone? Good. OK, I was waiting for where you had to think there. <laughs> now, how can you say to a native speaker that that was bad English skill? You can't. But it was, you're just not used to it. I've, I've been doing this for like, what, I don't know, 20 years. So I can just turn it on at the, uh, the turn of a switch. But if you're not used to it, even somebody who's been doing it a lot, like Jenny, takes a second. That's when you start having a lot more empathy for your students. And it starts telling you why they can't speak. 
Because if you're trying to do this at speed, this is what's tripping them up. The fact that they've never practiced it before. So once you start giving them more time to do it, then they start getting faster. As someone who's a native speaker who has trouble with it, or I had trouble with it too when I first developed it, I realized, wow, this is why they can't speak. Thank you, Jenny. Um, variations, my grandfather plays tennis with me. Does your grandfather play tennis with you? Wow, that'll screw you up, okay? Um, this is that idea of one idea, one breath. This is when I was trying to do a longer sentence with one student. And even though I believe he was one of the higher level kids, he was probably about a TOEIC 660, a TOEIC 670. He was having trouble with it in terms of fluency. Let's take a look at this. You have five minutes remaining. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you? So let's review. I, my, you, your, he, his, she, it, it's now, especially that S. If that S is not there, it changes the meaning. We, our, they, their. Okay. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? You live in Kitakyushu with your sister. With your sister. Does he live in Kitakyushu with his sister? Good. Very good. But again, we come back to this practice. <laughs> perfect grammar. Pronunciation was perfect, but that was not fluent. So, if we go, go back to this. He lives in Kitakyushu with his sister. If you feel confident, do everything in one breath. But try to do at least one sentence with no stopping, with a nice pace, all in one breath. Do your best. Ready? Go. I live in Kitakyushu with my sister. Do you live in Kitakyushu with your sister? Kitakyushu with your sister. You are going up and down and up and down. So smooth, smooth. Okay. I want to cut off that video in the middle because we're starting to run out of time, or we have almost run out of time. And I just wanted to show that the one student, or both of them, when I went to correct them, and it wasn't even a correction, it was a coaching tip. They swooped in to listen to me. They didn't try to avoid me. They didn't try to avoid me. They wanted to hear what I wanted, what I wanted to tell them because they started to switch their mindset away from being corrected about what's wrong as to how to improve. And that's where I'm going to start um, jumping ahead here. Okay, so these sentences can get a lot longer. I like watching Blu-rays at home more than going to the cinema. You can show me just about any grammatical structure that you want to practice for them out of their textbooks, and I can show you how to turn it into an SEVC practice. But you cannot just throw this at them like this. It takes weeks and weeks of getting them from I am, you are, he is, to the point where you feel confident they can do this. This is probably week five, week six. You don't want to just throw this at them and say, here, do this then you will get that blank stare and you will have lost them for the rest of the year, maybe the semester, okay? And there were other things that I wanted to show you, uh, something called the switch, where I'm just gonna very quickly go through these slides, where basically you're taking them on the first step to independent conversation, where they're taking this structure and putting in words that they chose out of their head and not just, or, or emerging from structure control to independent uh, choices for the vocabulary that they already have. Okay. And uh, basically, they ask a question, they take that question, use that to repeat uh, consistently, and then uh, they come up with a new word, and then that word is asked to the, to the other person. Jenny, can one you... One minute remaining. Yep. Can you just show me this one, Jenny? Sort of. 
Oh, you haven't done this one yet? Okay, Jenny has no. Okay, I'll tell you what then, because I've only got one minute remaining. Sorry, Jenny, to put you on the spot. This is in my videos, which I will show you uh, later on. But um, a lot of this stuff is starting to uh, pile up here. <laughs> and there was so much to show you. But this one I do want to show you. This is a classroom that I did not get their permission. That's why I had to uh, gray out their uh, uh, or, uh, face. <laughs> but this is what they're like when they're actually doing this by week 13. They're animated, they're gesturing, they're using their own English. There's no structure here. These are real conversations happening. They did not know what it was that I was going to show them. But eventually by the end, they were able to have their own independent conversations. Fluency first, accuracy later. It is a skill. It is not a fact set. There are potential pitfalls. And, um, and I'll just go over them very quickly. You've got to connect this to your materials. You have to start working with the JTE and the ALT together to figure out what to do in the speaking classes so that then it enhances the their ability to remember what it is that they're doing out of their, their textbooks, okay? Um, you are a coach, you're not a lecturer. And you want to start moving yourself away from just working off paper and starting to work from your own skills. The no fail scenario is very important. I have some uh, testimonials here. Not surprisingly, one of them is from Jenny Crittenden herself. Students don't want to stop. I get that a lot from teachers. They, they, don't, they just want to keep going because they go, wow, this is fun. These kids are animated. Um, Mary Virgil Uchida is a university teacher. She uses this both in university and at her English school with elementary school kids. This is done with elementary school kids. Um, junior high school teacher, Catherine Akasaka, another university teacher, uh, Adam Jenkins, they all find that it just worked for them out of the box. I gave them maybe 30 minutes of coaching and my slides and they went straight for it. My YouTube playlist is here. I will be giving you those links later. And um, maybe by the time uh, the end of the day today, you'll be able to get those links from Deanna. Okay. And um, I also want to uh, show you this one uh, petition. Uh, against uh, discrimination in Japan, because I promised uh, Kaylin, the, the high school student that uh, asked me to show this to you, uh, that I would show it to you. So I'm showing it to you. So please take a look. And uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I went over time, Deanna. Thank you very much, Mr. Cruz, for such an interesting presentation. I'm now going to ask you some questions that we received from the audience during our presentation time. Some of them have been kindly answered by um, Jenny already, but I would like to get your opinion on some of them. Certainly. So from uh, the live audience, we received a question. For implementing more speaking into class, how do you juggle the textbook and speaking? Since there are still standardized writing and reading tests, would earlier speaking tests be a good motivation for more speaking in and outside of the classroom? I know the new course of study is a good start, but what do you think we can do now? I think you have to take this in baby steps. And you, you're trying to take a very radical approach to speaking, one that's, that, quite frankly, does not mesh, has never been considered in Japanese junior high school or high school teaching. And I have not, I'll be very frank with you, not have had any experience in trying to do that. But I also want to say this to all of you. Any of you, um, and I will bring it back up again here, please take note of my email address at the bottom of this slide, jdmcruz, jdmcruz at gmail.com. Please get in touch with me. I will be very, very happy to help try to find a way with any junior high school teacher, any high school teacher, to bring this further into your classroom. And one of the most difficult things is assessments. And one of the most difficult things is finding a way to merge this with a textbook. Now that I have started to get more opportunities to present this at the JALT National Conference, to present this to other teachers, uh, it's getting beyond just my own little classroom and I have to help other people. The more I do it, the more I realize how much needs to be done. But the more I realize that it can be done, that it is an entire paradigm that has so much potential. So even though I cannot answer that question, I'm sure it can be answered with effort between me and other people who want to work with me. It is not impossible to come up with an assessment system that will work well in high schools and junior high schools and that it can be meshed with textbooks. I know the teachers are already starting to do it. And I know that I look at textbooks myself and I go, yeah, I think I'll use that uh, over here. And that's something that they're, they're showing in their, um, in their flip grids, in their videos. 
So I know it can be done, but I just don't really know how to do it right now. I would have to sit down with each individual teacher and say, well, how do you want to do it? Well, do it this way. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Munakata High School. This seems like an activity for people with regular classes. Can you recommend a way that ALTs with fewer classes can use something like this? I would suggest that you kind of try to encourage the students by getting them to do video assignments or showing them how to do this at their desks and then pairing that up with video assignments. So let's say you see them maybe once a month, okay? And you go through this and you say, you go from I am all the way to you go, does he go? Then you give them a worksheet that says, okay, here are the verbs. I want you to choose out of these 10 verbs, choose three verbs. And I want you to record your voice on your voice recorder on your phone. Okay. And I want you to record yourself actually doing that. Now, if you are feeling that they're up to it, tell them to do it on video. Okay. They're holding their video and then they're looking at their sheet while they're doing it. They email that to you. They're going to get a lot more out of it if they're doing that at a daily point uh, at home. So then it becomes homework. Then when they get to your class in the next month, you know what they should have achieved by then, and you'll know whether they achieved it or not by your responses over email, and that'll make you able to leap to a higher place than if you were only doing this in the actual standard classroom. Basically homework. Thank you very much. Jenny? I know a lot of you do not have the ability to allow students to use phones in the classroom. So what I had also mentioned was you can do it as a more of a one-off type thing and just get them to feel more confident and just do it when you do see them, so. If for nothing else, it might be the very first time that they've spoken English. If for nothing else, it might be the very first time they've heard their friends speak English. That in itself is a motivational uh, engine uh, for, for whatever else that they do uh, in the future. Well, thank you, Jenny. Deanna, anything else? We got a few more minutes. Thank you, Jenny, as well. Okay, from the live audience, have you ever changed the vocabulary after each round or alternated between new words? For example, I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, etc. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, if your students can handle it, go direct every time they seat switch, then go from I am, then go to I do, then go to I go. So there's, you have full statements, then the next switch, let's go to I am, are you, then let's go to I do, do you, and then uh, just go nuts. Yeah, you can do it every time. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it twice every time, but let's say you have a lower level classroom, then yeah, you want to give a couple of rounds for one verb, a couple of rounds for one uh, particular uh, practice. It, it, it is wholly adaptable depending on how you are looking at your students. And this is, again, part of that paradigm shift to thinking like you're a coach, not a lecturer who has to run through all of this material. And basically, you're looking down at your notes all the time, and your kids are starting to pass their own notes and sleeping on their desks because you're thinking about the text. You are watching your students. You're seeing, ah, Taro is not having a very good day today. That's kind of strange. His English is usually good. Maybe something happened at home. And you can start seeing that because you're looking at their eyes. They're looking at you, looking at their eyes, and they're starting to understand that this classroom has changed. This isn't about me looking at paper and the teacher looking at the blackboard. So that sort of thing, I think, is, is enhancing uh, what you're doing. And um, yeah, watch your students. Maybe they can handle a lot more than what I've been describing. Thank you. We have a question from Fukuoka Technical High School saying, is it okay to use this as a game for students? For example, they can switch up between I'm not hungry and you are hungry in order to try and trip the other students up. After they get used to it, they can basically choose if they want to add not or change the sentence in a way that they want. I don't want to say no right off the bat, but if they are not able to do I go to you go, you go does he go, he goes does she go, she goes does it go, with any degree of fluency, I would not be trying to find ways to trip them up. Uh, again, the no fail scenario. You want them to feel that this is literally, to use what might be uh, an un unattractive term for some people, this is a safe space for their English. This is not a place where they're like having to be very alert all the time, wondering where's the mistake going to come from. That din protects their anonymity, and they like that. And when 
they get to the point where they're trying to trip each other up, they're gonna see each other as adversaries. And yes, that might be helpful in some cases, but first establish the, the idea that the majority of their work in an SCVC classroom is cooperative. It is, it is coming out of a, a, a place of compassion from the teacher and a place of, of helpfulness from the other students. And you don't want to make them into adversaries too much. Thank you very much. We have one more question, two, two more questions. One from Itoshima High School, which you've already answered. Will you be sharing these slides or any additional resources for this method after the presentation? I will. And the last question is from Yukuhashi High School saying, how do you usually assess your students after weeks of SCVC? Okay, let me see if I can, if I have, yeah, five minutes. I'm gonna see if I can show my JOLT, no, not my JOLT one. Um, I was trying to find it here. Oh gosh, no, that's not the one that has it. Okay, okay, I, I, I thought I had a slide to show you, but basically, they go through about 13 weeks of SCVC to the point where they're actually able to handle, yes, in stuttering English, yes, in bad grammar, but without paper, without prior uh, practice, okay, in terms of what they're going to say, it's all unrehearsed. The practice is in the situational aspect of things, but they can go on to a five-minute unrehearsed English-only conversation, and they're graded on their um, equal speaking and their natural speaking. So no memorization, no turn taking, no prior turn taking where it's established that I'm one, you're two, he's three, and we just go one, two, three. So everything is randomized in terms of turn taking and I know how to enforce that. No memorization. If I hear even a hint of memorization in your voice, and we all know that we can tell when somebody's memorized something, that I'm going to stop this conversation, warn you that you've just dropped X number of points and ask you to continue. Um, and also there's ways to beat that later on in different types of tests where I enter the conversation so they can't memorize anything because I'm constantly, if I want to, switching the, the nature of the conversation. They're also marked on their uh, speaking style. So if they're looking down all the time, speaking in a very small voice, looking very anxiously and playing with their hair, their points go down. They have to be able to be vibrant, gesturing, looking at a person with a strong voice and smiling if they can, they get points for that. Their communication is marked, their ability to speak quickly and to speak smoothly is marked, but not their grammar, not their vocabulary. They are also penalized if they speak any English so that they have to stay completely within uh, English in those five minutes while there's always somebody speaking. Oh, there's, um, there's that, two rounds of that. That's a 10 minute uh, amount of time for the group to speak. And uh, the groups are about three or four. I get three or four students marked right there. They all get the same grade, so they have to work cooperatively. So again, as I, as I was saying, as an advantage to the teacher, there's far less marking. You don't have to take home a stack of papers. You can tell them right there, you got this grade. And I can tell you right now why, because you didn't speak very much, or you were constantly looking at the table, or you were letting your eyes float up to the corner instead of looking at your partners. I can tell them because it's fresh in my mind, it's fresh in their minds. I've got it right there on the table. Assessment is done for, for three or four students. Next, ten, next three or four come in, 10 minutes with them, assessment is done. Thank you very much, Mr. Cruz. So this brings us to the end of our question section. Thank you again very much to Mr. Jose Domingo Cruz for the time to deliver this excellent presentation. And thank you to everyone who participated. Have a good lunch. Have a good conference. Uh, if I don't see you, uh, thank you again. And I hope to contact with you through email. Absolutely. Thank you.